very kind. Uh, it's nice to be introduced by a friend when uh, the tables have been turned and I find myself in a rather daunting position behind rather than next to um, the lectern. Um, so as Luigi kind of indicated, what follows is a work in progress linked to an exciting long-term research project that VHI is working on with ACU in Australia and other colleagues around the world. Um, it is going to be quite dense in part, so um, feel free to nod off if you so if, you, if I could do so, I would do so myself. <laughs> You'll find uh, some of the texts that I uh, note or quote um, listed on your handout. I start with a series of odd facts. Although 1.2 billion of the world's population would describe itself as Catholic, as Roman Catholic, that is, <coughs> there is surprisingly little recent scholarship on the nature of that defining adjective, Catholic with a small c, and the corresponding noun, Catholicity. <coughs> that adjective, Catholic, is one of the four traditional defining marks of the Church, as we reaffirm every time we recite the Creed, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Indeed, we should note right at the outset that it is, of course, not just Roman Catholics who recite those creeds. Anglicans, Orthodox Christians of various kinds, Protestant Christians, as well as plenty of other creedal Christians, also describe their churches as Catholic. So the number of people who use this adjective is, in fact, rather larger than 1.2 billion, their differences notwithstanding. Not for nothing did the brilliant, but rather verbose, Swiss Reformed theologian Karl Barth write, that a church, quote, is Catholic, or else it is not the church, end quote. Catholicity, whatever it is, turns out, in fact, to be a big deal. Another fact, the vast number of people who use the term across denominational divides should immediately suggest to us that there may be multiple understandings of it, the varieties of my title. This variety is not just synchronic across the world right now, and, of course, with the ever-accelerating development of modern media, since the introduction of television, which seems a long time ago now, how much more are we aware of that synchronic diversity right up to the second? But that diversity is also diachronic. The contemporary multitudes of people with some definitional relation to the term is exponentially increased when you consider those who have used it in the past and, of course, those who will use it in the future. Most words are used differently in different places and at different times. As Nicholas Lash, erstwhile Norris Hulls professor in this university, rightly underlined, words have dates and histories. But I would add the implicit corollary, they also have futures. And in the most tentative part of the lecture at the end, I will try to gesture to two possible futures of Catholicity. In the face of such variety, where can one start to think about the possibilities? Well, a good place to start, in this case, but not all cases, is etymology. The term Catholic clearly comes from the Greek roots kata and holos, yielding katholu, according to or through the whole. Not for nothing did ancient Greek writers like Aristotle and Zeno use the adjective katholikos and the noun katholikon to talk about what is universal or most general. So there are treatises on the universals, ta katholike, which might, may be instantiated by particular realities in various ways, depending on your philosophy. But here we reach an early bifurcation in understandings of capitalicity, <coughs> that is, between quantitative and qualitative understandings of the term. Understanding the term Catholic in the sense of universal, quite a frequent temptation, can lead to a static, totalizing, and exclusive sense of the term. It is interesting, as the Jesuit philologist Walter Ong noted in a much-quoted popular article, that the Western Church did not, despite having the perfectly good Latin term universalis in its lexicon, by and large use that Latinate term in its early documents, preferring instead to transliterate the more unusual Greek term catholicos into Roman letters. As Ong points out, the etymology of universalis is also pretty clear, coming from the Latin roots unum, or one, and vertere to turn, so to turn into one and there is a clear undercurrent in that term, universal, drawing towards uniformity. Think of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The idea is that those rights apply fully and equally to all persons at all times, and an excellent idea it is too, but not perhaps the sense in which many have understood the term Catholic. It is uncontrovertible that if that were the sense of Catholic, namely universal, 
that the Roman Catholic Church, let alone any other ecclesial body, is not and has never been Catholic. Indeed, even the gathering of disciples in the upper room at the Last Supper was not Catholic in <coughs> that sense. It thus seems more likely that the qualitative path is more promising in our search. But even if we agree that Catholicity should be understood in some as yet undefined qualitative sense or senses, we are still faced with huge variations, even synchronically, let alone diachronically. Within contemporary Roman Catholicism, there sometimes seem to be as many kinds of Catholicity as there are Catholics. This was easier to demonstrate in the other city where I used to work, whose name should not be mentioned, but where you can, walking in a straight line down the Woodstock Road, onto St. Giles and then onto St. Aldate's, get a very clear sense of that diversity by encountering a series of rather different forms of Catholicity, passing by the Tridentinists, the Oratorians, the Benedictines, the Dominicans, the Jesuits, and ending up with of this day. But that city is an alien place. So let me just give a sense of those different Catholicities in a very hypothetical and slightly ridiculous uh, ethnography, which could easily be backed up by concrete examples. I'll limit myself to four example types, which I've cooked up very loosely based on the analysis by the great scholar of Catholicity, Wolfgang Beinert. An even more complex taxonomy of sociological types of Catholics can be found in the book by Arbuckle. Warning, these are caricatures. Big pinch of salt. So Andrew is most concerned with the liturgical matters. He feels that the changes of the Second Vatican Council and the diversity it introduced has ruined the pristine deposit of the liturgy. He seeks out the pre-Vatican II liturgy wherever he can find it, studies liturgical rubrics on the train, and associates with new orders and associations which promote that liturgy. He reads the blogs of Arate Celi and Una Voce website frequently. He does not attend his local parish. He is not concerned about the Church's teaching on social justice or even sexual matters, apart perhaps from abortion, and indeed has quite a vigorous and non-traditional sexual life. For Andrew, Catholicity is about the right worship of God, which the Preconciliar Church perfected. Bridget is most concerned about life issues, the defense of life from natural conception until natural death. She feels that family life is under threat in recent times, and that family and life must be defended always unequivocally. She goes on many rallies and participates in silent vigils outside clinics. She thinks that the traditional form of the family is invariable based on the Holy Family itself, and that the Church is the last, though faltering, bastion against the inroads of the sexual revolution. Like Andrew, she associates with fellow travellers and is not particularly attached to her local parish, because the parish priest is not clear enough on life issues and has indeed been known to let the divorced and unmarried receive communion. For Bridget, Catholicity is about a particular part of the Church's moral teaching which comes from a particular time and context in its ongoing history. Conrad is an eco-warrior. He is delighted with Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, and is most passionate about that best-kept secret of the Catholic tradition, Catholic social teaching. He feels the Church is very slowly coming to its senses and promoting just stewardship of the earth. He attends demonstrations to do with climate change and disinvestment in fossil fuel, fuels. He occasionally goes to Mass, but helps, around, uh, helps out around the parish a lot, most recently to install solar panels on the roof of the presbytery. He likes reading the eco-spirituality of Matthew Fox. He is not too fussed about theology, though likes the idea of our inhabiting and looking after God's creation. The rest seem like details to him. For Conrad, Catholicity is about the whole of creation and our care for the precious ecosystems within it. Danielle thinks the Church just can't keep up with the times. It's almost irrelevant. The Vatican II hardly began to scratch the surface. None of her friends can understand why she remains a Catholic. Many of them live together without any thought of marriage. Others are in same-sex marriages. Some are polyamorous. All are committed to gender equality. But Danielle remains committed to the Church. She finds nourishment in the Mass and reading the Bible quietly and secretly. She notes the ways in which the Church has changed and is unchanging. She intermittently feels God's presence and call in her spiritual reading and talks with a number of friendly priests and religious who are sympathetic. For Danielle, Catholicity is variable through history and is a task which the Church and its members need to work and pray towards. Remember, these are very crude, very crude caricatures, and only a tiny smattering of them at that, but you get the idea. 
There are plenty of other types, um, and I'm sure you've already thought of plenty of others yourselves. But there are some things to note already. The first three are what we might call partial Catholicities, to borrow a phrase from the late Cardinal a Avery Dulles. They have each, in their different ways, selected, whether consciously or not, one or other element from the Catholic tradition and raised it up as the whole. It has become the defining of Catholicity to poor form. In other words, Catholicity can be a cipher for something <coughs> else. They find an element in Catholicism which fits with their predilections and interests. That element, whether it's the Tridentine liturgy, a part of moral theology, or an environmental concern, is fixed, and their sense of Catholicity is defined around it. Danielle is more complex. For her, Catholicity is in motion. It is dynamic, even though it's frequently frustrating. But her relational and spiritual experience keeps her within it. She is very connected to the world in which she lives, and finds her personal spiritual life connects with it, even though she feels at times severe disjuncts with some of the forms, institutional forms, that Catholicism takes. This variety could be almost endlessly multiplied, but whatever else these few caricatures might show, apart from the limitations of my imagination, um, I think they do show um, a deficit and even perhaps a crisis, not too strong a word, I think, in our contemporary understanding of Catholicity. The Dominican theologian Yves Congar sometime resident across the fence here in Cambridge at Blackfriars, said that we are witnessing a deficit in Catholicity. Avery Dulles thought the same thing, and I think they are right. The caricatures are clearly partial Catholicities, where a part parades as the whole. They are also competing, competing closed Catholicities. They are not open systems. The first three operate with a mutually exclusive logic, their partial Catholicity excludes other partial Catholicities. They are not integral, integrating, or holistic. They are not, in short, Catholu. They do not engage, at least on the basis of the character, with the whole of reality. They do not draw its different aspects into some kind of coherent, if only dimly perceptible whole. And in recent years, Roman Catholicism seems to be beset by tribalisms of these and other kinds, where one or other preference or choice trumps the radical, in the sense of root and branches, breadth and depth of Catholicity. Indeed, it sometimes feels as if we are lost in the branches and have forgotten our roots. <coughs> you could say the epiphenomena have been confused with the phenomenon. Where are we to turn to rediscover the phenomenon? It will be no surprise, given that I try to be a theologian, to discover that I think the answer must start with theology. And if we turn to the earliest appearance of the word Catholic, we get a strong clue. Ignatius of Antioch, a bishop of the early church who was martyred in the early 2nd century, we don't really know why, but he wrote a series of important letters on his way to Rome to be martyred, uh, um, uh, gives us the term's first appearance in the theological tradition. Remember, like many other key and controversial theological terms, Catholic does not appear in Scripture, except in Acts 4.18, where it just means general. In his letter to the Smyrnaeans, Ignatius writes when discussing ministry in the church that, quote, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church, end quote. We might debate what exactly Ignatius means by the presence of Christ. He was a strong believer in the Eucharist as, quote, the medicine of immortality, or quite how he saw the role of the bishop. He is very interesting on the silence of the bishops, for example. But what is clear here is the identification of Catholicity with the person of Christ. It is, it seems, for the early Christian theologian Ignatius, a Christological matter. This seems to entail that Jesus Christ is fully Catholic and, our, and is our access or window onto divine Catholicity, and therefore that our earthly ecclesial forms of Catholicity may participate in Christ's Catholicity to a greater or lesser extent. <coughs> But what does Ignatius <coughs> think about Christ? What are the contours of his Christology? We can take his famous Christological hymn in his letter to the Ephesians as an example. He describes Christ like this. There is one physician, both fleshly and spiritual, born and yet not born, God in man, true life in death, both of Mary and of God, first passable, then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> 
Striking here is Ignatius's pairing of opposed characteristics in Christ, fleshly and spiritual, life and death, human and divine. Ignatius seems to think that Christ unites opposed characteristics in his single person. He thinks that Christ has a paradoxical identity. And, of course, you can see where I'm going with this. If it is Christ who ultimately must be the measure of Catholic identity from Catholicity, and Christ can be said in significant ways to have a paradoxical identity, then it should follow in some way that our own Catholicity must be paradoxical in analogous senses. We could go to many places in the diverse theological and philosophical traditions of Catholicism to develop this theme. For instance, the paradoxical Christologies of patristics, or the apophatic or ne negative Christology of the Council of Chalcedon in 451. But the area, I think, which is most interesting and relevant at the moment is a high point of Catholic theology between the world wars when the Western world was being torn apart by ideological forms of tribalism and mutually exclusive thinking. Precisely at this time, in various places, but especially France, Switzerland and Germany, a group of theologians who later became known as the resourcemal theologians, theologians of retrieval, sometimes and originally pejoratively as theologians peddling a nouvelle theologie or new theology. These resourceful theologians, through their very diverse theological projects, were actually promoting a view of Christ which was paradoxical, and they used various different terms to indicate this. These theologians are especially interesting for the additional reason that it was substantially their theology which animated the Second Vatican Council, over whose interpretation we are still debating and arguing. If I'm right, it is their paradoxical or Catholic view of Christ which animates the documents of that council. Regrettably, the council didn't use their theology sufficiently. By analysing the documents and their various versions, you can trace their influences and show how they moved the conciliar text in an ever more Christological direction, redefining Catholicism more clearly around the figure of Christ. But the job was left half done, I think, so there are different kinds of influences in the council documents which thus allow a wide variety of interpretations. But I think that Pope Francis has been picking up that unfinished task. At any rate, these resourceful <coughs> theologians focus their conjunctive theologies of Catholicity, I like to think of them as theologians of the Ampersand, around the paradoxical figure of Christ in various ways. We can only look at a few uh, uh, here, but there are, there's plenty more to be discovered, and I'm uh, happy to be reading this to anyone who's interested. The central figure of this constellation of theologians is the French Jesuit Henri de Lubac. He is the most paradoxical of the resourceful theologians. Right from the time when he did his novitiate and early studies in this country, in the early 20th century, he shows a consistent interest in thinking about Catholicity, Christ, <coughs> and Christian life, in terms of paradox. Um, and I've been lucky to see his early student essays from this period, which are not yet published. And in these essays, which were on Pascal, he writes of truth as a complexio positorum, rejecting views of truth as the golden mean between two extremes, or a collection of heterogeneous elements, or an abstract ideal or a system. De Lubac waxes lyrical and says of truth that it is, quote, neither anemic nor timid, it is not afraid of exaggeration, does not reject contrasts, nor elements which seem to oppose each other, but rather adopts them, unites them, joins them together in her breast. The truth is one, but it is comprehensive, end quote. He praises Pascal's desire to bring all of reality with all its contrasts and contradictions into unity, unlike mediocre minds who ignore some part of reality in order to form a coherent system. Note the stress on taking a small c Catholic or all-encompassing integral view of truth. De Lubac agrees with Pascal that the human is a concentrated paradox. Quote, what a contradiction, what a marvel, judge of all things, cretinous worm of the earth, depository of truth, cesspit of uncertainty and error, glory and riddle of the universe. Know then, O human, what a paradox you are to yourself. End quote. At the heart of these early essays is Christ who unites contraries in the mysterious union of his human and divine natures. De Lubac writes that Christ, quote, explains everything, he saves everything. In him contraries meet because he is fully man and fully God, end quote. Pascal, quote, Christ is the centre, the object, the reason, and the crowning of everything. 
in whom all contradictions are reconciled, end quote. In this early essay, we see that not only is Christ paradoxical, the conjunction of opposites, but so too is the human person and truth itself. So Lubeck's Catholic worldview seems to be a paradoxical one. Later in his life, de Lubac wrote a series of booklets of Paradox in 1948, 58, and 94. And it's in the first of these that he explicitly states that the Incarnation is, quote, the paradox of paradoxes. And again insists the Gospel is, quote, full of paradoxes and the human being is itself a living paradox. But what does he mean by paradox? And here he gives us one of his fuller explanations of the term. He tells us that a paradox is, quote, the reverse of what, properly perceived, would be a synthesis. But the proper view always eludes us. Paradox is the search or wait for synthesis. It is the provisional expression of a view which remains incomplete, but whose orientation is ever towards fullness." End quote. Here, paradox seems to be an expression of our limited cognitive possibilities here on Earth, our epistemological limitation, yet always oriented towards an ever greater Catholic fullness. Indeed, Catholicity seems to be an orientation to ever greater fullness in, in de Lubac. As for opposition, he tells us that, quote, oppositions in thought express the contradiction which is the very stuff of creation, which permits the movement of history, and which it is the end of this movement to surmount, with ever quite achieving the endeavour, end quote. Paradoxes, quote, suppose an antinomy, one truth upsets us, another truth balances it, the second truth does not restrict the first, but only places it in the proper perspective. The paradoxical truth is not limited to one plane. That is why, most of the time, why neither Christ nor St. Paul explained a paradox." End quote. One might begin to pick out here a Christologic of paradoxicality. Neither element of paradox trumps the integrity of the other element, but rather mutually completes the other non-competitively, just as in Christ, Divinity does not displace or diminish humanity. Likewise, de Lubac insists that paradoxes unite elements on different ontological planes, which, at least Christologically, accounts for both the opposition and the union of the opposed elements. Humanity and divinity can only be united because of the radical nature of divine transcendence of the Son who assumes the human nature. De Lubac continues in this Chalcedonian vein. Quote, paradoxes are paradoxical. They make sport of the usual and reasonable rule of not being allowed to be against as well as for. Yet, unlike dialectics, they do, do not involve the clever turning of for into against. Neither are they only a conditioning of the one by the other. They are the simultaneity of one and the other. They are even something more, lacking which, moreover, they would be only a vulgar contradiction. They do not sin against logic, whose laws remain inviolable, but they escape its domain. They are the four fed by the against, the against going so far as to identify itself with the four, each of them moving into the other, without letting itself be <coughs> abolished by it, and continuing to oppose the other, but so as to give it vigour." De Lubac thinks that all spiritual teaching takes paradoxical form, and moreover that, quote, paradoxical in its substance, spiritual truth is also paradoxical in its rhythm. When we discover it and hold it in our hands, we do not have time to bring our first look of satisfaction to rest upon it before it has already fled." End quote. So for de Lubac, paradoxes are expansive, explosive forms, strong wine which breaks down our usual tendencies. Quote, we are too desirous of being set at ease. We make a petty religion for ourselves and see a petty salvation of our own petty proportions. End quote. We settle too easily, we might say, for partial Catholicity. De Lubac sets great destructive store by the paradoxicality of Catholic Christianity and Christ in particular. He's very fond of quoting Irenaeus' uh, Adversus Heresis uh, in the book, fourth book, quote, Christ in bringing himself brought every novelty. So Christ dis disrupts our petty systems by this paradoxicality, forcing us to ever newer, more expansive, more integrating, more Catholic visions. The disruptive conjunction of opposites which captivated de Lubac from his early studies and which he sees focused on Christ remains a leitmotif throughout his writings. You can see it in his major work, works Catholicism and Supernatural, and the latter works Defence after Condemnation in The Mystery of the Supernatural and especially in his late um, The Brief Catechesis on Nature and Grace. 
Throughout his work, then, de Lubac maintains his concentration on the paradoxicality of Christianity centered on Christ. Christ is, he tells us, quote, the center and bond of all Christianity's articles. All its expressions, all its developments are only so many means of understanding Christ better and of situating ourselves better before him. Dogmatic formulae channel divine revelation on condition that one always re relates them to the center from which all radiates and to which all must lead. Jesus Christ, end quote. To Lubach's vision of Catholicity is in fact thoroughly Christological and therefore thoroughly paradoxical. Now, as I have said, the paradox involves opposition. And it's important to notice different kinds of opposition in order to avoid the noxious zero-sum logic of mutual exclusion to be found in the various tribalisms of today, the partial Catholicities I mentioned earlier. The most elaborate reflections on difference and opposition in ressourcement thought can be found in the writings of Romano Guardini, often overlooked and rarely studied today. This might change now, given that people are waking up to Guardini's ongoing significant influence on Pope Francis. Like other ressourcement thinkers, Guardini wanted to join up theology with the breadth and depth of life in all its aspects. He wanted to develop a Catholic view of reality. And he does this on, by focusing his wide theological engagements with psychology, literature, and philosophy on Christ and his conjunction of opposites in his paradoxical person. He chose, interestingly, to write on Bonaventure, not Aquinas, for his doctoral theses. And in those two texts, he talks of Christ as the medium or mediator, a centre between two extremes. He writes that because of sin, the opposition between creatures and creator has become a gegensatz, a contradiction, thus necessi necessitating a uniting mediator. Guardini stresses that Christ for Bonaventure as this medium is not in fact between the two extremes of humanity and divinity, but is, quote, in relation with both and participates in the nature of both and is confected out of both, end quote. Again, notice the emphasis on the conjunctive Catholic expansive quality of this Christic paradox. In fact, the coincidence of opposites focused on Christ is a major theme of all of Bonaventure's theology. More significant, however, are Guardini's next texts. Both in 1914 and again in 1925, Guardini wrote explicitly on opposition and developed his own, what he called, an enantiology, a theory of oppositions, enantios meaning opposition. These are the texts which fascinated um, Jorge Mario Bergoglio as he started a doctoral thesis, and their influence on his writings can be clearly seen, especially his lecture on political anthropology published in 1989, <coughs> but even in um, Evangelium uh, and Laudato Si, as I have noted elsewhere. And Massimo Borghese has now expanded on this in his recent intellectual biography of Bergoglio. In these two texts on opposition, Guardini is exploring how our perception of concrete reality and life is formed through opposites. We perceive, as it were, stereo-visually. Guardini develops a thoroughgoing system of opposites divided up between categorial and transcendental opposites. The former categorial opposites are subdivided into intra-empirical and extra-empirical opposites, Intra-empirical opposites are states like static and dynamic, form and formlessness, integrity and differentiation. Trans-empirical opposites are qualities like production and disposal, originality and order, immanence and transcendence. <coughs> Whatever one might think of this particular, somewhat complicated sounding taxonomy, the fundamental point is clear. For Guardini, we perceive reality through partial facets, and must strive to think the opposites together, to have a more Catholic, small c vision, you might say. In his inaugural lecture as professor of the Catholic world view, uh, I think he was the first person to hold such a, a chair in Berlin, Guardini linked this oppositional way of thinking to Catholicism's particular genius, and to Christology in particular. Catholicity, he thinks, as we've seen on strong etymological grounds, is the attempt at a perception of the whole seeing in the round, we might say. And the whole, for him, is Christ. In his Das Wesen des Christentums, echoing and replying to Feuerbach and von Harnack, he insists that the essence of Christianity is the person, Jesus Christ, not some moral or doctrinal package, not some tribalism, we might say. 
all, quote, existing things refer back to Christ in their essence and reality and have their substance in him, end quote. In his classic Christological work, Der Herr, <coughs> significantly published in 1937, he insists that Christ is at the centre of reality, redefining it, and that we need to think not, quote, about Christ, but think from him, end quote. Eric Shivara, also a Jesuit like de Lubac, develops this, this strand of paradoxical Christology famously in terms of analogy. So paradox in de Lubac, middleness in Guardini, and now analogy uh, with Shivara. But he also uses the looser form of paradox. Like de Lubac, he talks of Christ in his 1956 article as the paradox of paradoxes. He reminds us of the etymological understanding of paradox, a view which goes beyond the doxa, or received opinion, something which expands our perception, takes us beyond the prosaic. But he notes that paradoxes also involve opposites and contradictions, and in a way reminiscent of Guardini, he insists that paradoxes are not just, quote, the neat and tidy being together of the opposites, a kind of juxtaposition, but they are somehow in each other, so that a new account of each emerges a more inclusive, more Catholic one. In his late big work on anthropology, Mensch, Shivara develops a massive paradoxical anthropology of humans as a tension of opposites, a star of form conjunction of theoretic and practical, the deathly and the erotic. But his major development of this paradoxical thought form takes the form of analogy. Following the Fourth Lateran Council's promotion of analogy as a way of talking about the relation between creator and creature, avoiding the noxious extremes of equivocity and univocity, both still with us, of course, Shivara's life work was a massive reworking of the analogy of being. And it is this which he thinks is the paradigmatic Catholic <coughs> form. Like Guardini, he links Christology and a paradoxical thought form as constitutive and structuring of Catholicism to core. Regrettably, the Christological aspects of Shivara's analogical thought have been rarely remarked on in the scholarly literature, though the work of John Betts at Notre Dame is a significant exception. For Shivara, the analogical thought form of Catholicism means that all creaturely difference is couched in and enabled by the non-creaturely God who transcends it, yet is imminent in creation. The similitude of Latin IV is dependent uh, on the dissimilitude of the creator God who creates ex nihilo, is transcendent and imminent at once. For Pshivara, the thought form of analogy brings together and coordinates two different kinds of difference. God's radical difference as creator, which is so unlike any creaturely difference or opposition that it is not excluded from them, but rather enables all creaturely difference. Pshivara often uses the phrase, quote, in and over us, to describe this mysterious, complex, and dynamic relation between creator and creature. Shivara is trying to avoid, in a way reminiscent of Guardini, two twin <coughs> disjunctive dangers, what he, Shivara, terms theopanism and pantheism. In pantheism, any distinction between God and the world is collapsed, and the integrity of both poles is destroyed. The world becomes God, and God loses any distinct agency or identity. The in us trumps the over us. Imminence absorbs transcendence. In theopanism, by contrast, God is all and the sole agent in the world. The over us trumps the in us. Shivara, with his development of paradox and analogy, wants to assert both the similarity and the radical difference, the involvement and the detachment between God and creatures, and the one because of the other. His Jesuit identity focused on the God who is semper maior, ever greater, underwrote his analogical thought with a radical sense of the creator God's transcendence. Christ, for Shivara, is the clearest revelation of the analogical shape or structure, the revelation of the relation between God and the world. He is the measure of, quote, how God and the cosmos are related to one another, in the Logos Lamb who was slain, end quote. In particular, he focuses on, focuses on the cross <coughs> as the locus of this Christological analogy. It is, he thinks, only in Christ's death on the cross that we see the complete similitude between Christ and us, which is then included and redeemed in the dissimilitude and novelty of the resurrection. Christ, the concrete analogy, 
shows God taking on what is ours to give us what is God's. A dynamic, paradoxical thought form runs like a thread through all of this. Chivara's version of this kind of thought is less symmetrical than de Lubac's paradox or Guardini's medium. That emphasis on the semper maior of God's radical transcendence gives his analogical thought rhythm and dynamism and uh, an asymptotic quality. But for all these authors, at the heart of Catholicity is the paradoxical Christ uniting opposites in himself. Finally, I want to turn briefly to the Dominican Yves Congar to see how this paradoxical thought form takes shape in his thinking, especially in his ecclesiological and ecumenical reflections, which, has many, which have many useful lessons for our quest for Catholicity today. We see here an analogous, though more muted, um, dual emphasis on Christ and polar thought forms, linked to novelty, diversity, and change. Congar picks up on earlier reflections on kinds of difference, especially from the 19th century theologian Johann Merler, and harnesses them in his remarkably open and dynamic, grounded theology. Key to this was a keen appreciation of different kinds of difference. Surprise, surprise. In true and false reform, Congar alights on Merler's distinction between destructive contradiction and positive opposition. In section 46 of his Einheit, Merler talks of the mystery of all true life consisting in its ability to penetrate all that is opposed to it, end quote, using musical analogies to illustrate his ideas of diversity and unity in both euphonious and cacophonous forms. And Merler goes on to distinguish between contradiction and antithesis. He says that, quote, true antithesis can only be found in unity, whereas contradiction tears unity apart. Muller's idea of Gegensatz, translated here as antithesis, is close to our other author's ideas of paradox, middleness, and analogy. In diversity and communion, Congar builds on this sense of unity and difference and opposition. He says that there is nothing, quote, more contrary to Christian unity than the quest for unification, wanting to universalize one particular form, end quote. Think of our tribal Catholic caricatures. What is needed, according to Congar, rather, is a tensive holding together of the oppositions within an organic living unity. Catholicity, then, and not uniformity. Quote, the Gegensetzer are contrasted positions which express different aspects of reality. When they are held in the living unity of the church, excuse me, which embraces them, each one is corrected by at least a potential openness to the complementary aspect. They interpenetrate in such a way that they have a mutual relationship. These are diversities in unity. Heresy arises when a subject or group is isolated and develops its Gegensatz outside communion with the others. It then turns this into a Widerspruch, a contradiction. The restoration of unity does not come about by a reconciliation of contradictions among themselves, as in Hegel, but when false oppositions turn into authentic contrasts within the church. End quote. Congar deploys a polar form in analysing the church. Quote, One single church made from above and below, and talks of the, quote, the duality of the hierarchy pole and the community pole, and the church being actualized in, quote, the living relationship between these two poles. When this diversity of unity is lost, quote, the originality of the mystery of Christ is lost, <coughs> end quote. Catholic unity or Catholicity, quote, does not abolish diversities, but is constituted on the basis of those diversities, end quote. He urges us to resolutely to confront our deficit in Catholicity, a deficit in our ability to think and act in the round, Including, including diversity in union. Frequently, Congar suggests that it is Christ who is the principle of this diversity in union, this Catholicity. He notes that Catholicity is received entirely from Christ, <coughs> quote, in whom dwells the fullness of divine energy capable of reconciling, purifying, unifying, and transfiguring the world, end quote. Moreover, there is a set striking sense in which, for Congar, we continue or expand Christ's incarnation, instantiating the kerygma of differentiated unity in our lives. Quote, the perpetual youthfulness and vitality of Jesus Christ is lived out and made actual by new contributions and by the constant series of questions which demand of our fidelity a new response. End quote. And here he emphasizes the Christ who 
is to be. Quote, there is the Christ that is to be, through a power that comes from his historical incarnation and passion, but also through contributions and a doing which are, we hardly day say it, our part in his mystery, end quote. So what are the pedal notes <coughs> of these resourceful thinkers thinking about Catholicity after a rapid uh, and very selective um, survey? First, and most obviously, they think it is a quality openly framed for us by Christ's person. It is thus a theological quality. They choose various paradoxical thought forms of different kinds, drawing the most radical differences between creator and creature into union to express that all-encompassing Catholicity. Those paradoxical thought forms intend the inclusion of all of reality. Their use of paradoxicality and mystery to such a significant degree makes their models of Catholicity open-ended. They are stereo-visual, looking both to creation and to the future end times through the prism of Christ. Their use of the categories of difference and opposition, included or redeemed in Christ, shows the scope of their understanding of Catholicity. For them, nothing is excluded. They make their own in this way the evangelical and charismatic imperative to address the gospel to all of creation. Their models of Catholicity anchored in Christ are radically exocentric rather than self-referential or sectarian. <coughs> this does not mean that they forsake unity or focus, but that they address the Catholicity modelled by Christ in his person and in his existence to all. Theirs is a model of Catholicity which engages all and seeks to communicate and dialogue with all. Any limitation in this would fundamentally be a limitation in Christology, and thus of theology. Secondly, and building on their use of oppositional categories to show Christ's engagement with all of reality, we should note that they wish to engage uh, with all of reality as it is. They think that Christ and Catholicity is concerned with all of reality, not just some subsection or tidy corner of it. The history of 20th century theology especially the reception of the Second Vatican Council, is, is in significant part the story of the patchy progress towards filling out Blondel's insight. And Pope Francis is vigorously picking up that new way now. All this means, thirdly, that Catholicity for these thinkers is a dynamic quality. It is never, short of the eschaton, the end times, finally fixed. It is always seeking out fresh or rediscovered realities to engage with. Catholicity should not be staid, petty, or prosaic. Because the person of Christ is at its centre, and the communion of the Trinity which Christ expresses, it also means that Catholicity must be an integrally relational matter. It is not ultimately about propositions to, to believe, though these are obviously involved, nor about a list of rules to stick to, though these too are significant. It is about, fundamentally, the relationship to the living and ever more radically transcendent God, through God's earthly manifestation and incarnation in Christ in the dynamism of the Spirit. All of this means, in turn, fourthly, that Catholicity may be best thought of not as a noun, which can be completely and definitively defined, as we have seen the variety of such definitions make that task nigh on impossible, but rather more as an adverb. Its dynamism, prompted by the all-encompassing nature of its source and goal, namely God, which from our earthly perspective must always seem in some respect aporetic and thus approached apophatically, seems to pick out a quality which is primarily in action and should qualify the way we perform all actions. To be Catholic for these thinkers is to exist and to act, to be in a Catholic way. As Je the Jesuit John Hawkey notes, developing Bernard Lonergan's thought, Catholicity in its fullest sense is coterminous with being itself and thus potentially qualifies all existence. In this way, say, this way, we might say that Catholicity is more like a vector than a precisely defined set of coordinates. It gives direction or horizon to whatever it comes into contact with. It constantly expands our world view. This entails, fifthly, that from our individual perspectives at different points in time, Catholicity is always going to be inchoate, indeterminate, we can only perceive it in flashes, out of the corner of our eyes, so to speak. 
misplaced certainty is not appropriate when it comes to Catholicity. It cannot be totally defined. This chimes in well with another theological coordinate, which we haven't had we, we haven't got time to develop fully here, but is reflected on well by theologians, theologians as diverse as Thomas Aquinas, Wolfhard Pannenberg, and Vladimir Lossky, namely the eschatological nature of Catholicity, which is to say its full extent will not, indeed cannot, be known before the end of history and the union of all with God in the new creation. Because Catholicity is ultimately theological, to do with God and the widest possible purview of God's action, and given God's radical transcendence of creation, such that God can be creator of all, uh, all that is, out of nothing whatsoever, then we cannot know what Catholicity fully is until united with God. A God's eye view, just like the bird's eye view, will always evade us this side of the end. This also means, uh, sixthly, that Catholicity is ultimately a matter of mystery rather than a problem to be solved, <coughs> to pick up Gabriel Marcel's helpful distinction. This makes it both harder, but also more exciting and inviting. It does mean that we have to change lenses, however. To give just two examples, our theologies of revelation need to be more about encounter and living relation with God mediated through scripture and community, rather than a series of deductively worked out propositions syllogistically defended. Similarly, if God, Christ and humanity are ultimately mysteries about whom we can asymptotically learn more, then our moral theologies need to be diachronic, developmental, and grounded in reality. It must be more a matter of cultivating virtues over a lifetime rather than a kind of tick box approach to morality championed so widely up until the Second Vatican Council in textbooks like H. Davies's four volume Moral and Pastoral Theology which pronounced with admirable but misplaced precision on such matters as whether ingested toothpaste constituted a sinful breaking of the fast before communion, or how wide the priest should hold his hands out while saying the canon, not to mention his detailed prescriptions, or many proscriptions on sexual matters, which of course were printed in Latin, lest they offend the uh, readers. All of those matters, of course, were grievous sins. All this uh, might suggest that we should lighten up about Catholicity, its mysterious, aporetic, dynamic, paradoxical qualities may make it hospitable to capacious humour. Hansel von Balthasar, another resourceful theologian who also dabbled in paradox, writes, quote, The saints are never the kind of killjoys who go in for fault-finding and lack all sense of humour. For humour is a mysterious but unmistakable charism inseparable from Catholicity, and neither the progressives nor the integralists seem to possess it. Both of these tend to be fault finders, malicious satirists, grumblers, carping critics, full of bitter scorn, know-it-alls who think they have the monopoly of infallible judgment. They are self-legitimating prophets. They are rigid, while the Catholic is pliable, flexible, yielding, because the latter's firmness is not based on herself and her own opinion, but on God, who is the ever-greater. What does this all mean, finally and extremely briefly, for the possible futures for Catholicity? As Robert Schreiter notes, debates about identity heighten in times of change. Think of the period of the Reformations and the many forms of definitional, mutually exclusive thinking which flourished then, with Robert Bellarmine, for instance, adding a further 15 defining marks of the Roman Catholic Church to the standard form of one holy Catholic apostolic. We seem to be in analogous times now, both within the church and without. Ever-narrowing tribalisms seem to beset our ecclesial and secular lives. We face many constrictions of Catholicity. In such humorless times, perhaps the approach to Catholicity championed by the resourceful thinkers can offer a way forward for recapturing some of the essence of capacious traditional Catholicity. This will require paying attention to the inclusion of differences, and especially to the radical difference between creator and creature, engaging with all of creature reality, exploring secular or partial <coughs> Catholicities, for instance, through the wide variety of arts and sciences, finding ways of inscribing those partial Catholicities within broader metaphysical and theological frameworks. It will require paying attention to our intrinsic historicity, our social embeddedness, the full range of our existence, from our emotions 
to our use of social media and all the other ways our desires and worldviews are either constrained or expanded. I fear that if we cannot find ways of recapturing this expansive, more traditional kind of Catholicity, we are doomed to an endless factional bickering of, ever of an ever-diminishing kind and with concomitantly empty, uh, 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 ever decreasing returns. The factional sectarian future of capitalism would ultimately be a future, I suspect, of self paralyzation and irrelevance. The resourceful conception of capitalism is a challenging one, which seems to give little certainty, few definite moorings. It is unsettling, perhaps. We need to be courageous. But because the coordinates of this vision of capitalism are strictly theological, we should also take heart. Ultimately, Catholicity is not up to us, but to God. It's striking, as Marcel Sarot notes, that in the Creed, the Catholicity of the Church is included as a work of the Holy Spirit, who animated and animates the life of Christ and derivatively our lives. We need to trust that that spirit is at work in the Church and the world, and we just need to put on the best spectacles we can find to perceive.